Good, let us begin. Good morning. So we all, so even if you have worked a lot here, uh, we have already done quite a bit. So um, you have understood actually how this lecture works and kind of seen it's a, a slightly a bit different, but I think uh, what I've seen in the labs, you guys actually have remembered quite some things from the activities here. So I will do more of them. Um, so you have actually learned what the, what Internet of Things is in the kind of an initial view on it. I think you will constantly shape it during this lecture. We've done a little bit on hardware buses. Um, you have uh, been exposed to story-driven development. So I will have a guest visiting me tomorrow who is a former PhD student who did his PhD on story-driven modeling for the Internet of Things. So and he will have probably two, three slides here in my lecture tomorrow. So you will see one person who did story driven Internet of Things development in practice. We have talked about Internet of Things exchange formats. We have talked a little bit about protocols and you did some research on the kind of big players and big alliances in this realm. So bear with me, even if I give you now uh, two more exercises. Uh, after these two exercises, I will actually do something. Eventually, if we have some brave people, you will help me doing this. So we'll have a small live demo of one of the things we are exploring here now. So bear with me. Sorry, uh, I know some of you kind of get tired of it. But actually, you're pretty awake in the lecture, so I don't believe you. You're actually more awake <laughs> doing this stuff than actually just listening to me. So this is kind of more of a critical thinking task we have now. Um, so I want you to think. Instead of Googling, I want actually you to think and discuss with each other. <laughs> so you have now seen some kind of beginnings how to use Internet of Things. You have done a little bit of stuff in the lab. And uh, I want you to uh, critically reflect on this and think how can we scale this up? Of course, you, uh, everybody knows here, okay, just two devices is not an Internet of Things. Uh, we might want to get this up to 50, 100, thousands, or even more devices. What problems do you expect coming up there? Uh, how can we do testing? Yeah, so how can we actually give some quality uh, in this realm? And think especially while you discuss this now, what role will these kind of simulators you just learned how to build play in this scope for helping to scale up? What role might MQTT play in here and why might this be a good or bad choice for actually employing? And what role might these stories play we have briefly sketched here in class? And if you have other points you think which might be important to have to be respected, please feel free to write them down too. So I want you to actually discuss with your neighbor or neighbors. So if you have five here in the first line, so make a, a group split of three and two. And think and discuss 10 minutes with your neighbors and write at least two common points down for each. So basically what uh, role do these three points I gave you here play in scaling up um, and at least two points you probably will come up with more than two points and then we would take this to an open discussion and I try to yeah relate the knowledge and my own knowledge with you. Ten minutes from here. Task is clear? Yeah and yeah Discuss really, just have one person log it and then just copy it uh, for, the, for the log, yeah? So I want you to actually talk with each other and discuss these points open. Because you can't Google that, I just need your opinion. Oh, you, you might be able to Google that, but... <laughs> so, consider you want to now do it first for 100 devices and then for 1,000 devices. What will actually happen? Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, scaling and testing. What problems do we face? What, how can we solve them? How to do uh, scenarios, simulators help in fixing these problems? <coughs> Mm-hmm. We think kind of this, uh, yeah, predictive maintenance is kind of dif difficult or um, well, finding, <coughs> okay, finding faulty devices. So uh, could you see something with MQTT, how you could actually prevent that from happening? <coughs> an identifier and the devices which didn't send it, they may be faulty. Yeah, so the basically that's called watchdog or heartbeat. So you want a watchdog or a heartbeat mechanism and with MQTT you could record that to a central server where that is. Uh, central server usually should ring another alarm bell for you. What happens always if you have a central server? What can happen then? Single point of failure, yeah. So if the server goes down, then the whole system goes down. <coughs> yeah. So um, maybe solution is heartbeat central monitor. But okay, that's you, you can also kind of uh, work around the single point of failure and kind of having uh, replicated servers and kind of backup servers. So that that can actually work. So else, what what else happens when we want to scale up? Well, if you want to test a lot of, so let's talk a bit about testing. How can we do better testing in Internet of Things? What do we need to test devices or software in Internet of Things? Uh, mm-hmm. You want to combine the idea of scenarios and simulators yeah. to have a couple of very specific uh, scenarios in which you can test the device and monitor the behavior. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good thing. So I think that always comes if you use scenarios, you have at least a couple of very specific tests. How can you automate that a little bit? Because, okay, you can kind of set up the simulators and then put the device in there and then they can produce data and you can consume it. But I still think we haven't solved how we can configure then this device so that it works in this right setting. Do we need something to support kind of having a configuration of the device in a specific setting? Have you done something with configuration management and uh, kind of being exposed somewhere to that? I think you might have maybe with programming phones or so you have kind of seen kind of a default set of configuration parameters there is so wi-fi settings and this kind of stuff that's usually the same on every android phone how to how to configure this so somebody else google has done some nice abstraction there for you to to fill that so you you assume <laughs> that it, if it works in one scenario then it works in another scenario too but you, wouldn't, you, you want to actually kind of find these configuration parameters and then test these in different environments and then assume, okay, we've tested that there, then we can assume that it works probably in the others too. Yeah? So think about configuration management. And which things you want to manage. Management. So can the scenarios help in terms of scaling? How 
would you use the artifact of a scenario to scale up? Okay, one solution is you build bigger scenarios, yeah, with more devices planned in. How else? Maybe you build a scenario which itself could be um, scaled. So maybe a scenario just takes. Um, ah, so you you did you kind of work with n devices or so instead of a fixed number of devices? Now that's kind of you, actually that. That's not how scenarios usually work, it's, but it's kind of what you want to do. You want to actually have one scenario with one device, one with five, and one with 50, and then see, okay, what is actually changing in these scenarios, and then you want to make a use case uh, of this, where this one parameter is actually variable. So you basically take one thing which kind of grows in the scaling, and so you can actually use this, these scenarios to test the device without building it. Yeah, so you can basically scale up a scenario, can make it with, can take the scenario and put more devices in there. And then you can play through it and see eventually some problems without really programming the device. You understand that, that idea? So we basically can do some things on paper and then say, oh, I think if we take 100 devices here, then probably our network will be congested. Uh, even without having tested it, you can actually, with sm some smart people, sit there and, and think with a scenario and you will probably have ideas what will go wrong. Yeah? So sometimes you can find mistakes without programming. And scenarios can actually help you, especially in the Internet of Things, where things are so heterogeneous, to find some of these uh, non-functional requirements uh, just via playing the scaling up only with the scenarios. Yeah. Just scale up scenarios and find problems there. So when you want to do an update, have you thought about that? What what issues will happen if you want to yeah update a hundred devices? I discussed that with a couple of people here. <coughs> Cannot? Well, not like really at the same time. No, we, we cannot yet, but. Yeah, but. Ah, you're right. So that's could, this could actually be an issue because if they all are out of service, then you might actually run into trouble because you don't get any data at that time. <coughs> I don't even have a really good solution for that. I think you have to then have a planned update. <coughs> okay, yeah. Question is, can you update them all at once? So I'm assuming we have devices you can update all at once. What is the problem there still? Yeah, and it would be probably very time consuming if you have to go to each of the device, take it out, flash it again on your computer. So you want some kind of automated solution there. Uh, so first we want to be able to update them wirelessly. Yeah, I think everybody agrees uh, we need something to update the devices over the air. But we also want, yeah, so what happens if we have one specific software version and update all the devices. What might be the issue? It might be an issue that on one device the software works, on, and on the other device it doesn't. But then it fails and everything just crashes. Yeah, so if you basically um, yeah, do a mistake in updating the driver for the temperature sensor, uh, the LEDs might still work, but the temp all the devices with the temperature sensor might actually then, then fail. But also, what? so if you think about configurations, what could happen if we update all the devices? We could lose the configuration, yeah? So because we have kind of configured all the devices to do something specific, and we want to we make sure that they do the same thing after we update them. Yeah, so somehow we want to, so if you have hundreds of devices, you have to kind of know 
that one of these devices has this configuration and the other device has another configuration. So you want to actually be able to uh, to monitor that somewhere. <coughs> yeah, so this is actually also configuration management. What do you want to manage? And how do you keep uh, specific configurations? Now, let me see. Do we have anything else we wanted to do? Yeah, in general, what, what, what can simulators help you in scaling up to? What's the great thing about simulators? When you can spawn a lot of simulators for free, basically. Yeah, so if you need to see just what happens if you have hundreds of devices producing a specific amount of data, it's much easier to have 100 simulated temperature producers than actually building 100 devices uh, with this. Yeah? So simulators help because it's easy to spawn a lot. So any other problems you found or ideas you had when you were thinking about scale? So something I haven't addressed here now. I'm pretty sure you found more than I did. <coughs> no? <laughs> yeah, there's a chance, but it's pretty sure that a simulator can't exactly reproduce the real scenario. So the disadvantage of simulator, simulator, I only approximation nation of real world. That's true. So you have to make a balance between when you use a simulator and when you are actually doing the real testing. In terms of finding mistakes faster. <clears throat> How can we, how can we uh, facilitate this process that uh, we are aware of problems which are happening during updates, which are happening during our deployment, which we haven't found in the lab? How can we facilitate this process that we know about these mistakes and that these mistakes can be fixed easily? something we are just not doing right now. It's kind of, you need to think about the communication between you and your customer, yeah, or you and your user. So there must be a mechanism which allows a customer to report errors, and there must be a mechanism so you can fix the error, so via updates uh, or something like this. So you have to think about communication. You might have to think about community. Yeah, so some systems get fixed quickly because there is a specific set of stakeholders, like, like in the Windows beta program, kind of if you are this advanced user, so Microsoft rolls out uh, their operating system updates to a specific set of users first to do some pre-testing. Yeah? And there's a good communication between these people. So you, you might want to establish a process how you do your rollout in steps. Yeah, so communication and community so the open source idea is we create enough people who use it so that we have enough people who report the error. The industrial solution is uh, we create a consortium where everybody in this consortium is actually interested in testing this and then gives feedback. And then the other industrial solution is, yeah, we have kind of some professional testers and we have kind of some support line. Uh, and there, is an, there are short ways in actually getting things fixed. Uh, you might think about service level agreements, so you want to get paid for actually fixing uh, the devices of your customer. And they want to guarantee that you can fix some of these things. Yeah, communication, community, 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 and uh, consortiums, SLAs. 
support process. So, and if you don't want to, so you guys, you don't want to all build all this stuff, yeah? So when you, when, when you move from kind of doing something manually to doing something a bit more automatic, what are you looking for? Pre-built solutions, or is this kind of a term in the a software engineering <laughs> term, what that is? Template. Uh, template. We, we call that, if it's a system, we call it a framework, yeah? So we, we, <laughs> so we, we actually want a framework which helps us manage all this and helps us scaling up and helps us testing, yeah? So framework, what? If it's programming, we want an IDE, we want a plugin for the IDE, or an IDE coming with plugins, which actually helps us there. So we want, let's say, we want a framework. So now I show you why I was working so hard on the framework. Because the next exercise <laughs> is about frameworks. So there are Internet of Things frameworks actually tons in the net um, most notable uh, you have already discovered all join and iotivity have seen it already yesterday um, I don't know if we have time in class to actually look at Flogo we will use node red a lot um, Eclipse Cura is kind of new for me, so I don't know if we come there. I might have, there might be some space for you to actually explore some other frameworks. Today we will explore another framework, which is not listed there, but you might actually discover it. So I want you now to do some research what frameworks are actually out there. So I want you to spend five minutes to find four more than these. I want to definitely make you look at the four frameworks which are actually down there. Um, again, I want you to research what does the title of the framework stand for? Yeah, what is all join? Why is a node red called node red? Uh, I want to know if you can actually get that publicly or if you have to pay. If you have to pay, how expensive it is? Is there a free version? How good is their documentation? And especially as we like scenarios, are there any scenarios where this is used? Yeah, is there at least kind of a quick tutorial or so showing you kind of uh, how to easily get started with this? Or some of them might not be available at all and you want to at least see is there some, are there some use cases where people think that this framework is <coughs> most suited for? Is it good for updating? Is it good for working with lots of devices? Is it good for home use? Yeah, very important is, so there are a lot of frameworks out there which don't run on microcontrollers. So the, the smallest device these, these frameworks support are often Raspberry Pis. So kind of try to figure out what is kind of the smallest and the biggest device the framework actually supports. So kind of see if something like the ESP8266 or an Arduino is actually supported in there or something equivalent like an arm or a particle or something like that, a more professional <laughs> device. Yeah, look how it actually deals with mass deployment, yeah, with supporting a lot of devices. And see if they say anything about security and privacy. Maybe is there something, is it all encrypted? Is there... Uh, symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption. Um, is it all communicating to the cloud? Does Amazon, is Amazon able to read all the data you are doing there? Yeah, there's some solution which use Telegram as a communication platform. Mm, is that a good thing? Yeah, and that's it. So, five minutes to find four more then distribute it in the team and say kind of each of you does two or so and maybe double up some of them. Then title, availability, documentation, supported devices and operating systems and yeah, then mass deployment and maintenance and security and privacy. And then we take that open. 
But so just this, just put into your own uh, portfolio what you have done. But if you if you like something what we kind of discussed now, feel free to edit. But that doesn't need to be in the lecture notes. Can be just part of your portfolio. Kind of personal notes, you know. <laughs> Do we need a five minute break here or some people are running away? <laughs> and we started kind of in time today, so. <laughs> okay, well, move on. We don't have time. <laughs> Good, let's first check if you, uh, if you found everything. Um, and then this is of course not a <laughs> an exhaustive list, but um, so you guys all did know dread. Did you find mongoose? And anybody of you would do mongoose OS? Okay, doesn't matter because we will do mongoose OS this afternoon. <laughs> so that's the one we will actually check out. Um, I doubt that anybody Googling just for IoT framework found you'll know IoT. So I'm not that high in the Google list yet, I guess. So Quora, you did, Flogo, you get, did. So I saw some people found open happy actually, yeah? Or <laughs> uh, did anybody do home assistant? Okay. It's kind of I don't know why open is so strong. Oh, home assistant is kind of the American uh, open hub. So if you do home automation, definitely not only look at open hub but also look at home assistant. Uh, FHEM anybody? It's kind of the old German uh, home automation software. It's ancient. It's kind of from the end of 80s, I think. That's what I used, or what I kind of had the feeling was old during my PhD thesis, which is kind of some time ago. Uh, yeah, IOTivity, I uh, saw that some of your shows, very nice, and all join. Did somebody do just all join, or did everybody do IOTivity? Good. Um, anybody did Apple HomeKit? No. Uh, yeah, Windows 10 IoT, I think I saw a couple of people looking at it. Uh, did you find Singer? Things board, things speak, <laughs> Zeta, K, or K, K A. That actually, uh, K comes up, uh, up pretty high when you search for IoT framework. So, I don't know, device hive. Anybody has worked with Blink? Blink is kind of very popular in maker circles. Uh, so you want to actually, if you do Home Assistant, open up and that stuff, maybe also check out Blink. That's kind of in the same uh, realm. Okay, Any, anybody found things which are not on my list yet? The RBS IoT from Amazon. Ah, yeah, sure. Let me, let me add this. <laughs> so, okay, we should have AWS IoT. What else? Uh, Azure, yeah, from Microsoft. Is that different than Windows 10 IoT? Yeah. Yes, the one is the, the Azure is an, an online platform, and IoT is the. the but that works kind of hand in hand, yeah. Still. Yes. Okay. Together. Let me kind of put that in one line. <laughs> Anything else I missed? So I was pretty good. Good. <laughs> Yeah, then let's start the discussion. Do I actually have, no, stop. Discussion. <coughs> so anybody has something to say about Eclipse Cura? Kind of what are the main points which should be mentioned? Anybody volunteering? We are the Eclipse Cura guys. You can also help each other. So this isn't a big performance we need here. Just go through the points I, I have here and kind of mention uh, what what does it what does Cora stand for? I didn't find it. <laughs> Anybody found something about the name Cora? Okay, sorry, I don't know it either. I was hoping. Um, so Cora is it publicly available? Yeah, it's open source. Mm -hmm. It's developed by Eclipse uh, Foundation. By the Eclipse Foundation, yes. Uh, how is the documentation? Have you, do you have the feeling you could use it? Quite good. Yeah. <laughs> On GitHub, um, there's quite good um, documentation. 
Are there any kind of examples or so where people show, share what they have done with it? Cool. Um, wh what does it support? Um, every Linux based um, system, um, mostly, but it's also it's a, a Java platform, so it can also be run perhaps on other systems. Mm -hmm. But probably, so is there anything which addresses microcontrollers in there? So there's no yeah, direct, so it's just kind of you assume that there are microcontrollers producing some data and then you can manage the data of it, yeah? Okay. Um, so how is kind of management of devices? Is there anything about this or is this because it's just a server solution so you just manage this one? You have Node. Uh, remote deployment capabilities oh. with OSGI bundles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OSGI. Yeah. That this is Eclipse's uh, yeah. J Java uh, on demand loading and discarding of modules in. OSGI is great. <laughs> I already used OSGI in my PhD thesis, so it's also a really old idea. But uh, yeah, uh, maybe you want to kind of read about OSGI one uh, funny afternoon because not everybody is super happy with OSGI. And that's kind of also, it's supposed to be very lightweight, but in some ways this is the bloat of Eclipse. So if you wonder why Eclipse often is uh, not as speedy and behaves as fast as you think, it has something to do with OSGI. Um, did you read anything about uh, security privacy? Yeah. Uh, Guru can be used as a gateway mm -hmm. outside uh, your local network to inside your local network mm -hmm. and um, it's kind of protecting like uh, the IoT devices, the microcontrollers from access um, from outside. I think as far as I know it has kind of a web GUI, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, can this be protected via HTTPS and... I don't think it's protected. Okay. I think it could because you can use external mechanisms to to assure that. Okay, so next one. Um, Node Red. Who did Node Red? Um, it's um, open source. Did you just try to find something about the name? I didn't find out about the red. Okay, but but Node. Do you find out why? Why is it called Node? Uh, because it, <laughs> there are nodes in the system. So yeah, it's about. Uh, managing a lot, a lot of nonsense. I think I read I read once about where it was called red, but it's the thing. It's a historical meaning. Um, did you, anybody of you found the red explanation? Not really, but it is also based built on Node.js. So. Yeah, that's also why it's called Node. Okay, to do for me, I have to. I I read once. I think what why why it was called red. So I will kind of try to deliver that later to you. Um, okay, continue. Um, the communication is pretty detailed, I think, and also good examples and tutorials. Are yeah, there's tons, of, there's this huge community around Node Red, so it's actually great because you find YouTube tutorials, you find uh, uh, just textual tutorials, and there are tons of plugins, yeah. Um, then the, it runs on all devices which support Node.js, mm -hmm. so also Raspberry Pi, Arduino, normal Windows machines too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, for mass deployment, there is a REST API um, where you can deploy the. Or oh, that's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, you can actually remote deploy, yeah. and uh, uh, so if you have several Node Red installations, you can use an API to to do upgrades. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you found the right thing. <laughs> um, for security and privacy, uh, by default, the uh, non Reddit uh, is not secure, but you can secure it with um, login, username, password login, uh -huh. credentials, and also now with uh, open authentication, open ID. Ah, yeah, yeah, I saw something about this yeah. plugin. So you can basically use your, your Facebook account to log into Node Red. Yeah. 
Um, what about kind of supporting microcontrollers in Node-RED? Anybody of you found something that regard and managing kind of a fleet of microcontrollers? Probably not, but <laughs> you, but I would, would be interested if anybody found something. Uh, I found something basically suitable for Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, BeagleBones, uh, they're kind of the predecessors a little bit. Uh, there was first a BeagleBone board, which had kind of similar capabilities as the Raspberry Pi 1. So if you go up in our, uh, to, to uh, Stefan Seliger and, uh, and Mr. Crusher, uh, they might be able to produce you a BeagleBone board if you really are interested in it. <laughs> It's an, oh, that's actually interesting. I haven't seen that. How how did they mention Arduino? That's interesting. Mm, not directly, but it's like interacting with Arduino. Ah, yeah. So that's again what you probably would also do with Kura and uh, um, what I think I don't know what we discussed discussed before. So basically, yeah, if you have devices which speak some of the protocols that uh, Kura or Node-RED speak, you can of course connect it, but there's no management aspect really to it. So uh, nice thing is that Node-RED actually speaks both MQTT and Coop. I don't know about uh, Kura, if you can actually install a Coop module in there, but so you can actually mix and match and actually even use it as a gateway between the different communication technologies. There's a hue binding for Node-RED and there's for most of the uh, <laughs> network protocols you have, you can actually use Node-RED as a gateway to uh, talk to it. Does that, anybody of you has ever done OSC, the open sound uh, control protocol? If you need to do something which has not very much latency and do something in the music area or for DJs, you want to take a look at OSC. OSC is basically a network protocol for sliders, for buttons, for uh, pianos, for uh, actually sending notes uh, or light events over the network. Okay, um, Flogo. Something, anybody up there done some Flogo and can do something, okay? Um, Even if it's not an IoT platform. <laughs> but what can Flogo do? It is uh, open source mm -hmm. and it's used for building event-driven apps. Event-driven apps, mm-hmm. So Mm -hmm. The triggers receive data, um, and there are handlers that uh, dispatch events and the actions uh, process on the events. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I think the documentation is uh, really well, so it's a good, stru a good, good structure. And there is a, a category called labs, and the labs uh, provide guides and tutorials and code samples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, it can, the runtime can be deployed on a can be deployed and compiled on a variety of devices. Um, Why is this interesting in comparison to the two ones we had just before? Um, what do you... It can be uh, run on microcontrollers? In principle, you can actually deploy it directly to a microcontroller. Yeah. And, uh, Did you find anything that to run something from that on an ESP8266 that's small enough to deploy to... An, ah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So kind of a management idea, how to yeah, deploy things remotely? Uh, I didn't find it, but maybe it's in the documentation. I think it kind of sits a little bit in between these frameworks and the programming language. That's, that's okay, why so they it's say it's not, an, not a framework. It uh, has a cloud mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, so there might be something. Hmm. I found something. They say um, it's not implemented and you have to use another framework. So you have to do it yourself, basically. Does it, uh, is it programmed also in a, it's also in a web GUI, is it? Yes, you can use it in a web GUI. Yeah. 
Uh, so it's kind of a little bit like what now Node Red has a little bit more, and I think also Eclipse Cura has a little bit more on board where they <laughs> think about that. Um, yeah, let's do all join or IOTVT. Who who wants first? Up there, anybody done some all join? Um, it is so the documentation is not yet that good. <laughs> So, and if you look at IOTVity, some people of you have looked at IOTVity and actually were a bit more successful. Yeah? Um, I found that, at least on the website, they say there are a huge amount of devices they support. And there's an ARM section containing the Raspberry Pi's, Odoid, Dragonboard, and mm -hmm. others, uh, x86, um, Intel Edison, Nano Board, Max. Mm -hmm. And also microcontrollers, the Arduino Atomega, 2560, ESP. Did you find some software, basically, where you can just download it? Mm, I didn't <laughs> really have time to look deeper. Ah. Um, but I found documentation on C, C++, and Java API. Uh -huh. So I think um, if you support C and C++, it's maybe... Small enough yeah. to be deployed somewhere. Okay, um, did you find something about security, privacy around all join respectively IOTivity? No. Yeah, so um, so I found they, they have like each device has a resource a secure research manager and it ah. filter the requests that it receives based on a policy and access control list. Wow. So they have something there. Yeah, I, I'm, I still would like to, I saw one demo of IOTivity on YouTube from, it's also kind of basically a hello world, <laughs> just switching on the light somewhere. Uh, but this is, I would like to see some more kind of real world, uh, yeah, deployments of it. Um, so let's, uh, let's do two more. Uh, so what about Windows IoT? Who read about Windows IoT? There's also a Raspberry Pi version as far as I know. Yeah, there are, um, so there's the devices are limited to a few, like mm -hmm. uh, from five, mm -hmm. Raspberry Pi 2 and 3D. Mm -hmm. Then Mino board filter. The Mino board, yeah. A Dragon board and AAVON upgrade. <laughs> Have you found some kind of real world deployments of it? Or is it more kind of a toy project from Microsoft? Any examples where people use it? No, didn't find anything. Okay. Um, one more. Uh, what did you, let me check the list. And let's talk about open up. <laughs> Second or third generation product, isn't it? Yeah, with a lot of tutorials and many videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, for the devices which are supported, OpenHub only needs a Java virtual machine to run on. Mm -hmm. So it supports very, uh, no, it supports many devices like Windows, Mac, Linux, Raspberry Pi, and so forth. 
Did you see any relation to to Cura? Because it also open up also runs on uh, OSGI, and it's also part of the Eclipse. Well, the, what about the Eclipse Foundation? Yes, so these they're kind of very close in some regards, Cura and OpenUp, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> um, OpenUp is a pluggable technology, so it supports more than 200 technologies and many uh, thousands of devices. Mm, yeah, but not. it doesn't have any management of these devices. Yeah, so so that was the only one we, we discussed so far, which was, so the Flogo had kind of looked a little bit like we could actually deploy it to microcontrollers. And none of the others so far, yeah? So we are kind of a little bit short still in terms of frameworks and how we can manage our, our little devices. Keep that in mind, because Mongoose OS does allow that. Um, let me kind of go to the, yeah, so I'm, Okay, next, next lecture, I will start with the demo I have here prepared. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I think I don't mention it today. So let's kind of look at what we need to do. So I had prepared a little bit of Node Red for you, but uh, yeah, we will start with this next time because we, today we won't do Node Red anyways. So I told you that I actually added a project. Huh? And that's basically uh, I will check this project in the beginning of next week. So you will tomorrow get some time to work on this project, but I want to actually mention it already today to you that you know that in which direction we are. So in this project, um, I want your team to pr uh, build actually a working system with two to three Vemoses, uh, the little uh, controller devices, uh, and the gateway, uh, which you already have. And I want you to use that the system uses MQTT. Um, so you probably have to add MQTT to the devices to actually do that. Uh, I wanted to communicate to the gateway and I don't, so I want you to have an integrator so that basically all the devices work with their own topics and then you have something which kind of uh, connects these topics. This can be either your own integrator or you can, if you like the, my Node Red presentation tomorrow, can use Node Red for actually connecting these topics to each other. And yeah, uh, you want actually to connect to this three different sensors and two actors. Yeah? LED is an actor, motor is an actor, um, LED strip is an actor, uh, display is an actor. So you, you already have played with actors and we want to have three different centers. So temperature, button, um, touch button, so flip switch. There, there are lots of in there. And I want you to find a scenario which fits this. Yeah. So you want to actually have a tiny scenario which kind of describes what this is and then you want to present this scenario with these devices to me. You say this is the garage, this is the uh, this is the button of my home door and kind of in this context of the scenario I want you to explain then the project to me. Is that clear? So that's the project that will be 10% of your grade. Today, um, ah, I should have shown you Node Red. So maybe I need to show you Node Red in the beginning of the lab. Yes, I think I take the Node Red out of the lab today. So today you will do mongoose. So I'll make this optional. So mongoose is a different uh, is a different uh, framework, which also allows the deployment to the ESP8266 devices. So it has everything in there. So it kind of the management and the devices. So there's a really nice tutorial online, quick start. And that's why I kind of told you download it in advance. So make sure that even if you have the break now that everybody of you has a Mongoose installation on their computer, then you can flash the devices, follow the first Hello World tutorial where you just control a GPIO port. And then second, you wanna get the temperature sensor running. And if you have time left, 
either start with the node red stuff and ask me about it or actually start with the project working on the project good so sorry for not giving you the demo um we'll do that the next time thanks